All right. My name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with Carl Mecklem. We're at Eagle's Nest Winery in Hillsboro. It's August 9th, 2023. Carl, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, pleasure. Uh, first question, why wine? Yeah, I think wine uh, represents kind of a beautiful place between uh, science and art. And uh, um, it's, uh, it's kind of a medium that, uh, that allows those two to kind of make this uh, beautiful dance. Um, they definitely operate with each other. And, uh, and on the, the artistic side, um, having kind of the latitude to, to steer you know, what we're, what we're making in certain directions is, is quite beautiful. Um, in, in particular, being able to have our hands on the vines and being able to take it from dormancy all the way through the growing season um, and kind of be flexible uh, with, with uh, mother nature and, um, and, and, and practice, practice farming uh, uh, and, and stewardship in particular, uh, I think is a, is a, is a wonderful place that I, that, um, that I really like existing. Yeah. Let's talk about life before wine a little bit. Tell me about where you were born and raised and sort of early life for you. Sure. Yeah, I was uh, born in uh, Timber, Oregon, which is, uh, which is kind of out by Buxton. Um, so kind of towards the coast uh, off of 26. Um, the, uh, my parents uh, built a house out there. Um, they kind of had a, an enclave of, of uh, a group of, of hippies uh, that... Um, that were all relatively self-sustaining, um, and um, during that time, my my uh, my dad worked at uh, at Virginia Garcia as a, one of the original MDs, and um, and and so my, my existence kind of revolved around uh, revolved around that area. Um, I went to school in Forest Grove uh, in my in the beginning years. I, I changed schools quite a bit, but um, but. Uh, a lot of my time was spent, you know, uh, either helping or playing in the woods or, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, existing in a, in a natural environment. Um, we, um, we still manage, uh, manage timberland out there, and so that's kind of close to my heart in, in as far as stewardship and looking at, uh, looking at, at forests as habitat, uh, kind of reveling in the, in the natural beauty of, of things. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so yeah, uh, the place was about 1,400 feet elevation. Uh, we had quite a bit of quite a bit of uh, snow uh, when I was younger, uh, and in a, in '96 it forced a move um, from from that place into uh, into in, into the, to this particular property that we're we're at now. Um, we had uh, uh, some livestock, and uh, and and the the cold and wet conditions really kind of made it hard for them to survive so uh, so we ended up making the move and and uh, so I ended up changing schools around that time um, and ended up in going to Hillsborough and going to going to Glencoe High School and um, so fortunately uh, we always had property uh, and so I I've been able to uh, exist in um, in something that's a little bit closer to to the natural environment uh, and uh, I think that's something that's really kind of shaped my uh, uh, my formative years and uh, and kind of my look at at, at um, you know uh, you know what what sustainability is um, what stewardship might look like um, how we might integrate with uh, you know with with uh, with nature mm-hmm. you know in kind of a holistic way. What came next for you after high school? Yeah, uh, so I went to uh, I, I I went to college. Uh, I did the 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 college right after 18 um didn't really work for me uh so i so i uh so i didn't do that (laughs) and uh and worked for a while um and ended up uh ended up going back to school years later uh and during the time i had a lot of fun had some uh, really close friends from from high school that we've uh that we we stayed in contact i live with them um and uh yeah, we we uh, we experienced a lot of really fun times uh, together, um, and uh, and so later uh, I ended up uh, going back to school. Um, kind of knew kind of what I wanted to do at that point. Um, science has always been like a real uh, real major interest of mine, um, and uh, so um, 
so I kind of took a track uh, uh, that kind of kept my options open as far as like looking at pre-med um, and that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, biology, chemistry, those, those, uh, those, those avenues have always really been interesting to me and, and uh, I think might, might be partially because my, my, uh, my dad was, a, was one heck of a, a mentor uh, <laughs> um, being, a, being an MD and, um, and so at first I thought I wanted, like, like I think a lot, a lot of people um, want to emulate their parents. I thought that maybe, you know, maybe that tract would be like what I wanted, um, but it really didn't feel very fulfilling. Um, and so, uh, maybe not necessarily, not to say, not to take, certainly not to take away from anybody else that, that, that may feel very fulfilling, but to me personally, it just didn't, um, it didn't really resonate. And, uh, and so it kind of left me feeling a little bit lost. Um, and so through some, some kind of, uh, uh, through some events, uh, we I, we ended up purchasing the farm. Purchased a bunch of a bunch of property. Purchased a house, um, and an old family friend kind of like came back into the orbit and uh, ended up doing an internship at uh, at a at a winery, Ru uh, Ruby Winery in uh, in uh, uh, Laurelwood um, or near Laurelwood, and uh, and through kind of this. Uh, Odd exchange. We ended up. Um, he was staying in a house that we were remodeling. Um, he spoke super highly of uh, of the winemaker that was operating there, and suggested, you know, maybe maybe you should do a do a um, you know an internship. See if you see if you like it. And uh, and so um, so I so I I figured uh, you know during the next summer that uh, that I would that I would take uh, take that opportunity. And um, and I did, uh, and I really loved the uh, I loved the camaraderie. I loved the science that was involved with it. Um, I, I mean, I loved the long hours. Uh, uh, it was it was quite fulfilling. Um, always have been somebody who loves food, who loves uh, loves loves smells, uh, and the aromatics and everything. Um, that kind of permeated the winery, especially during during active fermentation, was just like intoxicating, you know, maybe on multiple levels. <laughs> and uh, and so um, so I I, uh, I I also found that um, a lot of the time wineries kind of operate within like uh, within these kind of confines that like you know, you know most places aren't. You know, most people don't fl uh, flex between vineyard work and winery work. It's like kind of one or the other, um, kind of these two different teams. And um, and also, what I found is that a lot of the skills I had through growing up on farms and being around livestock and l knowing how to weld and you know, like uh, uh, being handy with equipment and things, things that really uh, kind of lent itself well um, to uh, to this because really it is agriculture. Uh, it, it is a subsect of ag agriculture. It, it is production, um, but there are. Uh, but I mean, we operate around like three-phase motors all the time. We have forklifts. We have all these things that you know that um, if you know if you're if you know how to fix them, it can be quite advantageous to winery owners, uh, things like that. Because otherwise, you're making calls in to have people fix them, and it just increases overhead and and. Um, and so, uh, so I found myself as being, um, you know, like a, a relatively valuable asset, uh, just because of, um, just because of the, some of the skills that I had, um, and that felt great as well as being able to kind of apply some, uh, some knowledge to, uh, to, uh, to, to wine production in the sense of, uh, you know, in, in the sense of chemistry um, and, and 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 biology, uh, and. That kind of uh, that was really alluring, and um, but it it also felt a little bit disjointed because I really I love plants. I spent a lot of time in 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 uh, in college uh, learning about plants on a you know on a um, you know, biological level and and, and, and such, and uh, and so uh, it kind of uh, really spurred an interest into you know well what how does how how does the vineyard. How does that play into wine production? You know, are they separate? Um, are they intimately linked? Um, and 
uh, that kind of like led this that that led this quest for kind of understanding, you know, what what was one production. It started becoming very clear that that you know that there is a there are kind of two schools of thought, and one of those being that you know regardless of what the fruit looks like or what you know what's what's coming in, we can make wine, and applying hard science, um, applying you know like. Uh, Things that can, you know, enzymes for for extraction, you know, th things like that 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 can that can enhance enhance the wine. Um, there's there's a school of thought where you apply things like that, and then there's also this beautiful kind of old world approach where it's like that most of that happens in the vineyard. You know, the soil type kind of guides like the guides the production of the wine, um, crop load, you know, and this like uh, this deep understanding of what's going on in the vineyard. Um, uh, guides the decision-making process in the winery, and um, once I kind of started understanding, once I started understanding that, um, it just opened up this whole other realm of of, uh, of possibilities, and um, and w w which lent, lent itself, uh, which, which lent itself to uh, to to my own interest about plants and. You know, and looking at fruit as a biological process. Uh, you know, looking at stress, looking, looking at you know what do what do uh, thin soils uh, lend to wine? What do deep soils do to wine? You know, iron content, all these these like things that um, that we're, I'm fortunate enough now with this project to kind of let guide the hand of of, of wine production, and um, and I think that that the uh, the realm in which the the winemaker exists in in the in the vineyard too is, is a special place and something that I'm like I feel very very privileged to be able to to uh, to represent in this industry. Um, this industry is beautiful in the fact that it represents so many different sizes. You know, huge production sites. You know, massive acreage and where we can kind of like zone in and we focus on things in a very like. Uh, a very small scale, you know, we're able to, you know, selectively harvest, we're able to watch the vines, um, that lends itself to, you know, uh, to identifying where soil, you know, soil types, where the delineations between soil types exist, um, you know, how that influences our, our pruning methods, or our training methods for those areas, and um, and what I've come to realize is like there's so much, you know, in this in 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 at least my beginning beginning there was like a lot of anecdotal uh, anecdotal kind of direction and and the understanding now that I have is um, is, is is much different and uh, I and I think that it's a little bit, um, you know, it it's just kind of like. Uh, Increase the uh, like the fo well certainly increase the kind of the understanding and the focus on like you know um, how we how are we going to be how are we going to produce wine off of these certain areas and since we since we run a very kind of natural um, uh, style of farming um, that really dictates it too since we're we don't we don't irrigate and we don't till um, and we have perennial cover crops and things so uh, this th that. Um, that really uh, has increased my awareness of, you know, what, you know, what what can wine production look like, you know, in, in, in different in different capacities, mm -hmm. and and I think that you know through that through that process too, like I've really, really begun to like romanticize about the old about like small producer and small producers in the old world. I mean, um, these family these small operations where it's like there's not no, maybe not enough revenue to. To, to have a huge workforce and so so their hands are in in all of it and like the understanding and the kind of the 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 way you are interfaced into into the the land that's kind of that's producing wine that you know that is that is uh, representative of the person and the winemaking style um, and also responsible for keeping them keeping them afloat is I, I think is uh, is is uh, such a beautiful representation of farming and kind of um, you know, like a, a cyclical effect, I, yeah. So tell me about the process of learning that for yourself from, from kind of an internship to sort of the next step. What was the education process like for yourself and what were the kind of the steps along the way toward where you are now? Yeah, uh, it was steep. 
uh, <laughs> it was. Uh, so really, the the wine production made quite a bit of sense um, as far as uh, from from like a with some chemistry understanding. Um, uh, and I also had a bit of understanding about um, about plants uh, in general, um, not necessarily in particular to the vitis vinifera um, uh, uh, and training methods and things like that. I kind of had I, I knew some of the like the underpinnings of the you know the biological processes that that you know that we were trying to harness through certain kinds of through certain kinds of trainings. Um, kind of understand understood you know what what crop load you know what crop load looked like um but uh, a lot of it was it was uh it was it was the most beautiful part of science and that is trial and error uh so just employing the scientific method um uh trying trying lots of different things failing at a, failing at some uh, i don't want to say failing a lot but failing at some for sure um and uh and a lot of reading, um, a lot of a lot of uh, reading and applying that um, uh, applying that to the project uh, th to kind of speak to this project, you know, um, we were also kind of I knew the, knew the direction. There was a big vacuum on the property. Um, we knew that we wanted uh, to plant vines, um, and we knew that. We didn't want to be grape growers. I knew that we wanted to, um, you know, I wanted to um, produce wine as well, um, and so we also were kind of like we we had some constraints, and those constraints were being like kind of bureaucratic in nature, uh, and uh, in Washington County, which is where we are, um, there are some requirements that you have to meet in order to have a winery. You have to have a certain amount of acreage. Uh, that being 15 acres, um, you also ha uh, or or you can have like a a, a, a long-term lease with a contiguous parcel. There's certain way certain ways to to avoid planting 15 acres, but not for us. And so we ended up um, the only way it was possible was to kind of do it in one big one big uh, big move. And so we planted about 22,000 vines in um, in a uh, in a in a in a spring and. Um, and so a lot of it at that point was uh, uh, what was trial and error. And the most interesting thing about th this style of farming is that you have like you have one decision, but in order or one decision that kind of governs like what happens over the over a part of a growing season, and and the the only thing between you and 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 executing is is like 22,000 vines so you just you just have to buckle down and just you know it's kind of like climbing a mountain you just you just you don't really you don't look up you know you just chug along and uh and you know i i think that it really um it takes a certain kind of certain kind of person uh with a level of perseverance uh to to do those kinds of things i mean like in the beginning, in the beginning season, we were cutting everything back to back to two buds, um, you know, to start the training of a stock uh, of, a, of, of a trunk, and um, and you know that is, uh, that is backbreaking. You know, I mean, it's just uh, it, it's a lot. It's a lot of it's a lot of labor. And one of the things that I really want to bring awareness to in this uh, through this project is that uh, you know that uh, there are so many unsung heroes. I mean, like. We talk about like wine production, and there are like groups of people that um, that do far more work than we do, uh, and and they are they are like uh, absolutely integral to to this uh, this industry. I mean, without without agricultural workers, uh, you know, we just we couldn't we couldn't do what we what we you know what we're doing. Um, uh, certainly on large scales. I mean, so for the awareness for this, uh, for, for our project is, is, you know, is, is that of a farmer and, um, and, uh, it, it's, uh, it's laborious. Um, so I guess the segue back, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of it was, uh, a lot of it was long days, um, in the field and then, uh, reading at night and then, uh, and then employing those and, uh, and seeing what worked, 
um, starting to learn about you know what soil types uh, do how how I mean how how plants respond to them. I mean we have three different soil types on our particular place. So uh, these deep well drained soils versus the thin shallow soils that have fragile pan. Um, it's an entirely different game. I mean like we it, it's, it's certain soil types. It's very easy to employ these pruning methods and you know um, you know do like a bilateral cane system where you have two you know you have two canes that you're laying down. Um, and I think that's where I, I want to speak to like the anecdotal thing is because you know we planted everything on these set these set spacings and at this point I mean um, hindsight's always twenty twenty but we have areas that you know, we could have increased uh, we could have doubled the amount of plants per acre um, and 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 uh, and they still would have had a hard time because we're talking about maybe somewhere between. 16 to 16 to 18 shoots on certain plants and maybe 8 to 10 on other shoot on other plants uh, and the beautiful thing about that is that um, the understanding that I've had is that and the privilege of not being a, just a grape uh, not just growing grapes is that uh, that those those stressed those stressed areas the vines that don't produce a lot of a lot of fruit um, they absolutely produce them uh, produce the most expressive wines um, I think that uh, that looking at looking at this at looking at growing vines um, from 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 that perspective is uh, is is uh, one of the one of the greatest understandings that I've had and the privilege of, of, of working in this project, um, and uh, and it's not always about just you know a bountiful crop you know it's about the it's about that it's about that stress about that the, about the ratio of of juice to to skin uh, and and then that's that's one that's a great that was a, a a great aha moment for for um for me in this pro um, project i mean we look at like old world some of the some like esteemed old world vines and they just look you know they look scraggly and somebody at like you know, somebody that was looking for a homogenous crop, a crop that was, you know, that was ultra vigorous, um, they would, they would, you know, they would, they would shy away from that for sure. And, um, and, you know, as far as this, as, as far as this project's concerned, our, our deep well drained soils, I mean, those vines are so vigorous that that's, that is the problem. I mean, disease pressure is higher. Uh, and so, you know, so as, as we've evolved, we condition those particular wines, or we 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 push those particular wines towards a towards a heavier crop load and towards white and sparkling pro projects because because um, we just don't have to worry about uh, late season disease pressure and so kind of that that goes in in line with kind of melding with with the environment uh, and not really trying to fight Mother Nature but trying to kind of um, uh, let it guide our hand. I think that that's that's the um, one of the the beautiful things about this about this project. So tell me about the this as this, as this project came to be. Tell me about sort of the timing on it. When did you when did you plant? Uh, I guess how did you decide on what you were going to do and when did you do it? Yeah. Uh, so we spent a couple of years uh, preparing the land, uh, let it go fallow for a little bit, uh, introduce some some uh, some. Um, uh, nitrogen fixers and some 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 stuff to, to increase organic material in the soil uh, and then we planted let's see in 16 um, and so we planted all 20 acres in 16 uh, there was a group of about I think five of us um, we had a, a close friend of mine from high school who uh, Jordan Anderson who uh, um, yeah, one of my closest friends who was uh, who was there with me in the in the in the trenches, um, and uh, and so the, so yeah, so we planted all 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 the vines in sixteen, um, and and then uh, and you know and then and then it started employing um, training training techniques mm -hmm. for for trunk development and then uh, and then going into particular. Uh, uh, pruning methods. How did you decide what to plant, and how much of that, how much of that, are you happy with the decisions you made? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, um, we planted all uh, all Pinot Noir. Uh, I, I should say to my chagrin, uh, <laughs> uh, it has it it has been a creative challenge in order to like segue a lot of different skews off of the same vine. I think it's kind of beautiful in. It is beautiful in one way because it really allows a lot of creativity uh, to 
you know, to run white project off of it, to run sparkling, um, to start delineating uh, red wines based on soil type so that we can see them side by side. Um, but I, I, uh, I lament planting uh, all Pinot Noir. Uh, we will plant white wine, uh, white wine for idols uh, in the future, um, but but as of right now, we we uh, we ha we um, we have to make white wine out of Pinot Noir. Uh, so uh, I would say that um, I am happy with all. I should back up and say that all the vines are grafted, and I should say that uh, for the most part, I think that the the um, the the grafting uh, the the rootstock uh, rootstock selection uh, was was good for the soil types. Uh, we also um, laid out blocks based on soil type as well. So I think there are some 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 things within the the layout that that were that were that were good, but. Um, I mean, one of the, one of the big ones here is that um, uh, is space. I, I, if I was to if I was to do it all do it all over again, I would add um, add lots of space because the reality is that um, there's a lot of tractor time, and uh, and you can get yourself into some really hairy situations if you don't have enough room, and. Uh, especially early season if it's wet and you know and you you I, I mean fortunately i haven't had any have haven't had any like um total wrecks or rollovers but i've been close uh more more than a handful of times and uh and i, I don't want to really do that so uh, so yeah i think that like design layout um uh spacing spacing absolutely uh on any kind of, uh, we're, we're um, uh, one of our main soil types is a windblown loss. So it's a volcanic sediment, you know, that kind of comes from the other side of the state. Very thin, uh, collects on these ridge tops. Um, has this like really has this restrictive layer between like 12 and 18 inches. Um, very very difficult to grow on. Uh, and I think that in hindsight, uh, any kind of planting on those would probably be at like two and a half foot spacing. Um, we're at five, so uh, so there's a lot of dead space, um, and we could go through and replant, every, you know, between everyone. But you know, it, it's also dealing with an existing trellis system, and I I, I, I think that that's a, that's kind of a beautiful that's a beautiful understanding. Um, I should say that you could probably make it work with the spacing if you irrigated. Um, I think water water is one of the major major constraints, uh, and uh, especially since we have a lot of competition. So uh, since we have perennial cover crops, and now we get our we 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 space our timing so that we can encourage uh, native species to flower for pollinators and such. Um, so I think there is a way to do it, but it might look like something like a like like full tillage and irrigated, uh, and then you might be able to make it work. Uh, don't know what that would necessarily do if that would take away from the nuanced characteristics of the wine because I think that the wine can be really really beautiful um, and have a lot of texture in it uh, I we have other kind of uh, data points in the area too I have a very close friend uh, Jared Hotty who um, who also farms in the area and uh, and so so kind of through both of our our lenses we, we I think that the understanding of trying to employ some like natural farming techniques uh, in different areas is is, uh, is clearer now for sure. So as you you mentioned, kind of taking a couple of years getting the property ready, planting all at once. Um, as your grapes are starting to come online, tell me about the process of beginning to make wine and what the kind of the plan was at the outset. Yeah, uh, well, because of the different soil types, everything has kind of been staggered fortunately it didn't all just like come online and all of a sudden it was like 20 acres of, of wine grapes here you go um uh that would have been that would have been really rough uh so um so we've kind of the the deep well-drained soils came online first uh we produced red wine off of those and some rosé um 
as time has come along, uh, we've had uh, one other soil type kind of come online. Uh, and well, two different soil types kind of come online. Uh, and so we've kind of had, to, for, fortunately, we've kind of had this staggered development of, of, um, of uh, wine, of, of, of production. And so in the beginning, it was, it was simply red wine. Um, I, I think our, 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 the first year that we actually got any, any grapes uh, was 18. Um, we didn't really have, uh, we didn't really, um, didn't really have much to speak of. Anyways, we were, we, I mean, mo for the most part, we were, we were, I mean, we were trying to go for vegetative growth and, and, and development of the, of the permanent structure of the vine. Um, but 19, in 2019, we had our first kind of large, large-ish uh, uh, um, yield, which, which kind of equated to about um, s somewhere in the ballpark of like 20, 25 barrels. So, I mean, uh, not, a, not, a, not a huge amount for sure, um, but, a, but enough for, for, uh, to keep us busy for a little bit. Um, and, and, and so then as, as we've had more and more production, we've been able to kind of employ some of these, uh, some of these practices to like keep them separate so that we can kind of start getting like data points uh, as far as what, what the soil types lend to the wine um, and you know, what, what kind of, you know, what kind of crop load can these vines hold? And, and so, so it's kind of taken this approach this, this much um, more uh, like nuanced approach uh, w once we had enough quantity of, of, of grapes to kind of start employing, uh, employing strategies to, to, to get, you know, kind of telemetry on, on what we're, you know, what we're working with. Um, and so, uh, so production has has uh, we've increased the amount of skews, um, and and we've started producing white wines and sparkling wines, uh, and then rosés as well. Uh, kind of, kind of, but, but just listening to you know, just looking at what what kind of crop load we're you know we're dealing with. Um, most of the deep well drained soils now. Uh, represent our uh, represent our our rosés and white productions. Most of the time, uh, most of the time, cluster weights are uh, are are relatively high. Um, uh, you know, w if we're looking at if we're looking at red wines and extraction from from uh, you know the ratio of juice to skins, uh, they, they aren't as suitable as as other soil types on our particular place. Um, and since you know, since in the winery we we, we don't use uh, we don't use any kind of uh, additives, um, I, I, it, uh, you know, a minimal intervention intervention approach. I look to uh, I look to to the extraction um, uh, as you know as attributes in, in, in the in the in the in the vineyard. That's really what where, where we're uh, where we're focused uh, as far as. You know how adequate it is for for red wine. So I, I would say that um, that that it's evolved a lot. The the the, the project uh, and and the quantity too. I mean we we are we see about a about a thirty percent increase in, in um, yield every year. So it's kind of like a like a story of shifting sands because we never really you know you never really quite know what you're gonna what you're going to need as far as, or what we're going to need as far as uh, space in the in the in the winery um, and 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 every year it becomes it becomes more even uh, even in in uh, even last year where uh, lot we were fortunate enough to we were fortunate enough to to escape without any kind of uh, frost damage so uh, it's been this steady increase and um, yeah, yeah, it, it is. Uh, it, it's it is really. It's nice that it has been this kind of um, consecutive increase, uh, because I think just if 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 everything had to come come online at once, it would have been an absolute disaster. You know, we would have we would have I would have had no idea what to do. Um, so, kind of growing into the space, uh, you know, growing as a winemaker. Um, the, the, that that this the, the trajectory has been like really really uh, 
really beautiful for that. Um, even in, in uh, 2020 when we had the wildfires and then COVID, it kind of allowed us to kind of fly underneath the radar. And, um, and, and that was, uh, you know, that was, that worked out well for us here because we, uh, we built this, we built this wine production facility in 2020. Um, and so that was kind of our, that was a pro, uh, one of the major projects, uh, during that time. So we were, we were, we were, um, we had our hands full, uh, <laughs> during, during the, uh, during the early phases of the pandemic. And then, the, you know, and then obviously the, the wildfires were such a disaster for, for the, the vast majority of, of, uh, of the, of the Valley. Uh, we, uh, I just looked at it as a, as a, as a, a moment to kind of, uh, to, to see, you know, what strategies we could, we could use to, to minimize smoke taint. Um, and, uh, uh, because that won't be the last one. Absolutely not. I mean, we, uh, resiliency is, is so important and, uh, um, you know, that won't be the last smoke event. Uh, you know, our climate's changing. Uh, so our, so, you know, drought stress will, will most likely be an issue. So, I mean, all these things I think are, are, um, are not necessarily cues, but there are ways that there, that there are these points where we can, where we can, where we can look at like increasing resiliency in, 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 in this industry through, you know, through, I mean, in the, in context of wine, maybe through skin contact, how much time you have, um, uh, you know, in the vineyard, uh, you know, uh, and doing what we can to encourage mycorrhiza, uh, you know, to, to, uh, help with drought resiliency. Um, I think, and I think that those really kind of come back to, uh, to, to, to that, that the notion of stewardship and kind of working with, with nature. Um, so let's talk about the farming part first. Obviously you mentioned, uh, that uh, there's been some some trial and error and some kind of learning along the way. So tell me about learning your space and learning about the different soil types, learning about the different things you have planted, and seeing and and what strategies have worked from the kind of stewardship perspective as you've seen the gra the grapes come into the winery. It, it, it's kind of a it's 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 really interesting because I I, I was I managed my last my last year because I took my I took the internship in my senior year in college. Uh, and I managed to take a soils class, um, and fortunately for me, it was uh, it was through I had a um, it was a, a class that had previously been taught by Scott Burns, the infamous Scott Burns, and uh, and so I, I I had the privilege of he he came in and did a uh, didn't um, I, I can't remember what they called him, but he was more or less like a. Um, adjunct professor or something like that at point that point uh, and he came in and did a entire class on on wine wine and soil and I was like wow this is kind of serendipitous <laughs> and so we, I ended up getting a hold of uh, uh, an old student of his uh, Andy Gallagher uh, who uh, has Red Hill Red Hill soils and he's a he's a uh, wonderful guy um, uh, you know a, a soil scientist scientist um, and I managed to uh, I uh, managed to uh, dig soil pits with him. Um, we have a little track hoe on the on the farm, um, and managed to dig soil pits and kind of delineate these soils. And it's so interesting because in practice, you know, we can we do all these classifications, um, but it's like only one part of the equation. You know, it's like you can you you can you can you can navigate around some of these some of these soils by you know by certain um, you know, by looking at uh, nutrient levels, uh, by using irrigation, by maybe doing uh, some kind of either uh, you know um, foliar fertilizer scheme, or or uh, or in the in the drip lines, or you know, there's many different ways to to uh, avoid these these nutrient deficiencies, or you know, or get it you know get it to how how you would particularly like it, um, and so I think that there is there's one avenue where you can kind of like skirt around it and in our the way that i farm um there's there's really not you're really you're really beholden to 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 to, to what's there i mean to to when a drought occurs um 
you know, uh, to what kind of nutrient levels you have. I mean, we, we can we can change change those, but those are but that's kind of a lo these long term practices like you know nitrogen fixers and adding you know organic material. Uh, we we can we can do that, but but these are they're they're not in the same time levels as like soil development, but but they're but they're quite long. I mean, they they don't just happen overnight. Um, and so in practice, kind of identifying the soils with him um, was, was very useful and seeing some of the traits and some of the, some of the, the, the aspects of, of, of these uh, particular soil types. But really in practice, it was an entirely different beast um, because, you know, I, we had never taken, I had never taken uh, you know, vines in development phase. Uh, I had never taken them through, you know, through development phase on these particular soils. Uh, and so that was an entire, an entire learning, uh, um, learning curve because, um, because you, you, you really don't, you, you don't, you don't have a don't have a really good understanding until you until 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 they're there in the in the ground, and once they're there in the ground, uh, and you're faced with like you know, losing twenty percent of the vines to you know to drought the first year, um, it, it really kind of it regears everything, and and so uh, so the learning curve was steep. I think in in certain areas we were maybe at like ten percent. Um, 10% loss the first year. Uh, it went down every year. Uh, I like to think that the vines, uh, you know, if they survived it, they were, they were, you know, that, that they, um, they were hardy enough. I mean, we did have some graft union failure, failures, some, you know, some, some things like that. Um, but, but planting the vines, um, once they were in the ground, it was, a, it was like, it was a reality. You know, it was, it was like, they're there, you know, uh, we've, put out X amount of money on these things, you know, it's like, um, as natural as you want to be, uh, if you're looking at like replanting 50% of your vines, uh, economically, it's not, it's not a viable, not a viable situation. Um, so yeah, we, so we, we, um, we ended up taking around a tanker the first year, watering them during, during that first season. Um, but I run a pretty hard line, and I, we added a uh, added a perennial cover crop after year one, uh, and um, and the vines uh, the vines kind of find an equilibrium. I mean, they're um, they do fight, find an equilibrium. I I, I, I believe in stress. I, be, I believe in in stress as far as a, a, a biological like a, um, a, as, as far as a biological component of the equation, uh, I think that that's that's so crucial, um, and 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 so uh, I, yeah, I think that in practice, I think I had an understanding of some of the some of the attributes, some of the traits that the soils had, um, but I, I, just, I had no idea, you know, just no idea, and it was a, a, it was a huge amount of work, and it was a pretty hot season uh, that year, and. Um, and I'm, yeah, I, and it was, it was a fat, it was a huge amount of play, a huge amount of acreage for, for us, for, and the amount of people that we had. So, um, if it had have been like, maybe like five acres at a time, it would have been so much more manageable, but, uh, but it wasn't. So, uh, so I'm kind of, yeah, I'm kind of glad that that was, that was, uh, um, that we're no longer in that phase <laughs> anymore for sure. Uh, but yeah, it was it was uh, it was quite serendipitous that uh, that you know Andy Gallagher um, w was available and that kind of interfaced with Scott Burns and um, and you know and 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 these these people that really have a, a, a this deep understanding of, of Oregon soils is um, uh, it, it, it's it, it's quite the resource for uh, for you know, the industry. I mean, I think that, uh, I would, I would imagine at a lot of places, uh, that are going through, a, um, a pre-development phase that, uh, um, that, that would be, that would be on their radar for sure. Um, uh, as it turns out, you know, with the way, with the way we farm, um, it's, uh, it's really, uh, it, it it's really the most, you know, one of the most important things. I mean, I, I, 
have kind of come to look at look at vines as this kind of conduit between what's going on below soil, you know, um, and 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 seeing kind of this, you know, um, seeing them as kind of these cue, these cues to uh, to kind of to influence our particular strategies uh, um, in, in in relation to uh, what we're doing above ground and and uh, you know our timing minimizing uh, minimizing competition you know th things like that yeah so as you moved into the next phase into the kind of the vinification part of the project tell me about uh, seeing those grapes come in and starting to make decisions for production and how sort of the early wines went for you how the how the production went for you not easy I would say that when we first got the the vines in uh, we didn't really have a production facility um, we didn't have barrels uh, it was kind of all like from uh you know drawing from the hip kind of uh it was very i think rustic is like the best way to put it you know i mean uh we uh at one point we were we were uh we were like dumping or like raising raising bins with like this old old for old tractor of forks that we had because we didn't have a forklift um we didn't have three phase power, so everything was like by gravity. Um, it was messy. Uh, it, the 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 barn, one of the barns where we were like producing wine, didn't have floor drains. So like every every time that every time something got messy, we'd have to like spray out the whole place. Um, now the now the barn is is our tasting room. Um, but it was uh, it was rough. It was really it was it was really rustic. It was uh, it was backbreaking. It was not it was uh, there was um, it was not sustainable. Uh, that's I mean I don't yeah I mean like increasing production on that on those kinds of levels would would have not that, that would not work. It was like it was like uh, it was like hobby level like amped up on ten and 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 uh, you know digging out stuff and and uh, foot treading because we didn't have a distemmer. Um, yeah, it was pretty rough the first couple of years. Uh, the wines were um, the wines were like a representative, uh, you know, to you know the representative of that of that rustic kind of nature. Um, they were, I think that the the kind of the clarity and the trajectory of of where the wines is going has like really increased. Um, I think that when you're dealing with those really rustic kind of uh wine production things it's hard to it's hard to employ techniques to kind of like gently guide the wine uh it's just you know it's like extract it you know it's like <laughs> you know we look at the look you can look at the numbers and then and then we and then we go from there um but you know we didn't have we didn't have temperature control so everything was ambient temperature it was pretty hot those those first couple of years so like we had pretty pretty raging um r raging ferments which was which was nice in the fact that you know like minimized it minimized uh the um the susceptibility of like stuck fermentations and spoilage uh you know spoilage microorganisms getting in there um so it, it was uh it, it was yeah i mean like rustic beyond belief uh <laughs> Yeah, the wines are the the wines from those years were. Um, I don't feel like they had as much. Um, uh, I don't feel like they had as much. Uh, I don't know, like as much. Not not. They had plenty of feeling because there's kind of some trauma involved with them, but they didn't have as much. They they didn't have as much like, um, like sight. They didn't have as much like. Uh, 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 of the essence of, of of the site, they didn't have as much essence of the soil. They were all kind of harvested at once, so there were these big blends. So they weren't like, they weren't representing different soil types. We just didn't have the means at the time. Um, so they they were just kind of like red wine, red wine from the northern part of the Little Tualatin Valley, um, and. Uh, and as time has passed, um, and we have you know more tools at our disposal, uh, things have really kind of become more clear, more clarified, um, more uh, more unique. Uh, I think the fir those those first wines were relatively higher alcohol contents, um, so a little bit more um, 
a little bit more of that kind of boozy, you kind of lose some of the, lose some of the delicate characteristics. It's just kind of like cherry or, you know, like, you know, those kinds of, those, those kinds of, um, bold characteristics that kind of come through either through iron or things like that, um, iron content or heat from the ferment. Um, and so now, um, now it's a little bit different where I've guided the project to be, you know, focusing kind of on lower alcohol wines, very low sulfites in the finished product. Um, you know, t certainly taking a minimal intervention approach, but also using, uh, using, uh, different areas to kind of like, to kind of enhance these these nuanced characteristics of, of the wines and, and and not being opposed to floor yeast um, and 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 uh, and not being opposed to um, being on lees for extended durations of times and so some of these techniques uh, um, ha have have uh, are, are are part and parcel because of because of having having space and having some of the tools that with that, that we can that we can use I mean even our um, you know, I mean, having a, having a, a, a nice press that, that can, that can, uh, you know, um, use, uh, that can be, um, that's a closed cylinder that we can use inert gas. I mean, now we, now most of the wine that we, that we produce, if not all the wine that we, we produce, a lot of the movement of finished wine is no longer through pumps, it's primarily through inert gas to kind of, to keep it really delicate. I think one of the big learning things, that, learning, learning, um, points that I've had is, um, is how, uh, how delicate Pinot Noir is, you know, and I think that that's one of the things that comes along with tasting wines from all over the world is that you start seeing these different representations. And I think that a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of my earlier understanding of what Pinot Noirs were, were from probably places that were larger productions that were really focusing on sugar levels. Um, that may have been adding acid after the fact, or you know, or, you know, to to um, to combat some of the physiological development uh, um, changes as they as they went along, um, and 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 uh, I think that sometimes that can feel a little disjointed, and you know, and the reality is that Pinot Noir is just such a such a beautiful, delicate, aromatic wine. Um, that you can just lose these things so easily, and so I think that through my through being exposed to more wines from coming from other parts of the world, in particular in particular France, um, that uh, that you know these lower alcohol wines that really focus on the the acid backbone, uh, you know, focus on like a on a pH that's that's. Uh, that's relatively relatively lower, somewhere in the you know three point you know three point four ish range. Um, that 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 picking uh, and not focusing on sugar level really uh, really can be advantageous um, uh, to, to 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 making wines uh, to making wines that are that are that are supposed to be very delicate. I mean, and I think that that's one of the biggest, the biggest uh, changes that, that I, that I've had, um, is, uh, is, is, I mean, even at this point, I, I think I kind of look at, uh, if I pick up a bottle off of the shelf and I see that it's a higher alcohol content in, in a Pinot Noir, I generally will kind of like be worried, worried a little bit that it, you know, it might be boozy. It might be just a really jammy or something like that. And, um, and those are really the, not the wines that we're trying to produce on the, in this project. And so, um, and so it, it kind of gives, you know, it gives, uh, sheds light on growing region, sheds light on elevation that you're growing at, maybe wind, direct, you know, all, all these, all these like little, these subtle, um, subtle environmental factors that, that really, that really play into, to play into, into wine production. Um, yeah, so uh, I, w I would say that yeah, that, that the clarity has really has really um, been honed in, and and certainly not to say that one way is right or one way is wrong, but at least as far as the path that I w that I want to take this project, um, that m my understanding of kind of my preference of wines, and you know what I'm looking for. Uh, you know, they, they generally kind of go hand in hand a lot of the time with, 
you know, farming techniques and and um, and that's that's been a beautiful part of the journey is kind of is having a deeper understanding on the production level uh, side of like kind of looking at values, looking at numbers, kind of understanding a little bit about like what a you know what a project's um, what a project's kind of uh, philosophy is as far as winemaking and farming, and then and then really and then really kind of uh, being curious. I mean, there's uh, we're 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 we have such beautiful growing ground within like 100 miles from from this place. I mean, we really do live in a spectacular spectacular environment. I mean, we go to the east and we find the gorge, um, which has just amazing growing grounds. And then there's the classic valley too, which represents quite a bit of different uh, quite a bit of different um, growing regions, but also a lot of. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, marine sediment uplift and a lot of uh, influence from, Missou from Missoula floods. And, uh, and, and where we are here, um, we're not, uh, you know, we're at about 650 feet elevation, not, not the wine production facility here, but, um, but uh, you know, you, you, these, these, uh, these, these things really, uh, um, these soil types really, really start, really start um, influencing, uh, you know, changing your perspective on, on you know, what, you know what can be done in certain areas, and I think that you know as the future goes along, um, yeah, I think that that becomes even more even more clear. Uh, higher elevation stuff is really um, can uh, I, I think in general higher elevation stuff is really really fascinating to me, really interesting, really producing like kind of tight wines, uh, you know, tight in the sense that they're you know that they're you know they have they're they have acidity. They have these delicate, you know, delicate, delicate aromatics. Um, I, I think that that's really something that you know draws draws me. I mean, in the, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, draws me draws me closer to them for sure. So tell me about the the uh, the, the the selling part of it. Uh, coming up with a brand, starting to sell wine. Uh, how did you sort of how how did the name come about, and how has the selling gone so far? Yeah. Uh, so the name uh, comes from uh, a uh, from a landform that um, that that I grew up on. Um, the names out there are kind of ridiculous. Like we grew up right, I grew up right next to uh, uh, Wildcat Mountain. I mean, like I think it was probably along the lines of like see something, name it that, you know, and uh, and that was about it. Uh, so we had a forestry, uh, forestry like a sustainable for forestry um, management um, company that we that me and my dad managed. Uh, really, all it was was uh, was about 180 acres of of, um, of land out in the coast range that I grew up on. Uh, and so when we first got started with um, with this project, that business entity um, purchased all the viticultural supplies, so trellis equipment. Um, Plant, or, you know, plant material, uh, you know, amendments, all those, all those kinds of, all the things that go into into um, producing wine, and um, and so we kind of just kind of just stuck with it because it's you know it's close to both of our hearts as far as you know that being where I grew up and that being the place that he and my mom um, kind of made their home. Uh, the they. Uh, um, they they built the house that I grew up in, um, and uh, all uh, many out outbuildings that uh, as well, and uh, and you know and the they had massive gardens every year, and so you know so it is a it is a um, it, it's a it's 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 a it's a reminder of my childhood for sure. Um, I mean a reminder of forts in the woods of of hearing him with a chainsaw and like finding him or, or, you know, cruising around with our dog, our dog in the woods. Um, and so, you know, I guess there's a, like a, a high degree of nostalgia, um, because it's, it, it's, it's the, it's where I, where I, where I grew up. Um, our, we, we have a, a little bit of a, of a, uh, a record or a history with like, uh, with social justice because, um, my dad, uh, my my mom and dad were both in the hippie movement. My dad being a little bit more um, uh, deeper into it on the social on the social side, um, you know, both living in communes and, and that kind of thing. And and uh, and then he, and then when he went to when he went to med school, he 
he, uh, he was one of the founding MDs of Virginia Garcia uh, Memorial Health Clinic. And so, uh, re you know, representing these under, like the under, um, you know, under uh, people that aren't, don't have advocates, I think is kind of like one of our, one of the main, uh, one of the main tenants. And so we ended up, uh, we ended up <clears throat> linking up with a, um, a, a man that represents um, uh, f First Nations peoples, and uh, and and uh, I think that these these kind of you know bringing awareness to some of the injustices that people that people face in these in these in these subsets of, of peoples that that don't have representation is is definitely one of the one of the big the one of the big missions that and stewardship are kind of the two two big tenets on this on this on this particular project. Um, so much so that, so that uh, this this property has uh, two conservation easements on it, a working farm and a working forestry, which um, prevent any kind of development goes towards either habitat on the working the working forest or um, or, or or solely farming on on this lower part. So yeah, so the name kind of has a uh, has a has a little bit of nostalgia. Uh, to me, uh, not I shouldn't say a little bit. It has it represents represents my childhood um, for sure, and uh, and 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 working with my dad uh, because that is part of the uh, part of the project. Uh, we are both very opinionated people. It's not always um, it's not always like super copacetic, but but we find a way <laughs> for sure. <laughs> uh, and as far as uh, as far as selling, so. Uh, I should step back and I should say that the winemaking and the farming make a lot of sense. Uh, the business marketing and selling is tough. Uh, these are things that don't necessarily come natural naturally to me. Um, so we've we experimented with self distributing to to wine shops, and we still do to a degree. Um, but really, I had no understanding of the economics of 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 of, of really what wholesale looks like mm -hmm. and i know there, there's a lot of people that um that are very good at that that can that can like distill it down to you know a uh, dollar or, or you know whatever amount of profit it is per bottle um, and they can make that work and it works on kind of these larger scales of economy um, that's not the that's not the trajectory for this project. Uh, we don't uh, the wholesale is it, it's it's uh, it's not the not the desired um, not the desired trajectory for this uh, for this project. Uh, DTC is really um, or direct to consumer is really um, for a boutique or a small winery. It really is the thing that makes sense. Uh, we are in a little bit of a different scenario where we're close enough to Portland metropolitan area where, you know, things like uh, Google Maps, like queues for like, uh, you know, um, you know, wineries near me, uh, we, we can get a, we can garner a lot of traffic uh, through through those kinds of avenues. And so we've been fortunate enough where we have uh, where we have a lot of foot traffic. Through, coming through with those, a lot of people uh, aren't necessarily coming here because because they 100% believe in the values of stewardship. Um, but it's really nice because it gives us like an opening, uh, uh, an opportunity to speak to them about our particular path. And I think that a lot of people are willing to pay pay a premium to support agriculture, to support you know whether it's organic or you know all those all these different these different terms that we have now and I think the one of the main ones is is supporting local local agriculture that's that's uh, employing strategies that that uh, aligns with proper stewardship uh, I, I should I should, I should proper is charged stewardship that um, that is trying to maintain an ecosystem um, and that's really uh, at the at the bottom level, that's really what we're trying to do in this project, and um, and so selling has been um, has been primarily through uh, through kind of trying to develop these re these these relationships of return customers, trying to develop a wine club, um, and and then and then 
getting the ear of kind of the random the random customer. Um, and I, I'd say that the reception, for the most part, uh, uh, is 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 vastly good. I, and I hope that through the project that we can that we can bring some awareness to to what wine represents. And I think that uh, if you if you go if you if 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 your if your environment where you're tasting wine is 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 a uh, is not if it if it's not um, representing the farming, it's 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 uh, it it can be a little. Um, it can it can take away from the fact that like it also at the bottom level, this is an agricultural product. You know, I mean, this is not this is this is this is vines this is this is grapes this and 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 then this is also wine production and and so you know trying to trying to trying to sell this as, as an agricultural product is 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 um has has been one of the main principles um and and so far um we seem to have a good track record with with uh, with kind of capturing capturing customers. I'd say that it's been quite interesting looking at the demographics of people that find that interesting. I would say that a lot of younger consumers are very interested. Uh, we also find ourselves close to Intel and like a, a, a younger demographic that has more of a disposable income. And I think that, um, you know, I, I, and, and, you know, the, the, my, my, my goal in those, in those situations is to, is to, um, is to present what we're doing, and um, and uh, and and hopefully they want to support our project by by buying product or joining the wine club, um, and and so that's kind of been the selling has been a has been an interesting thing. I've never run, I've never been a bartender, I've never I've never worked a, I've never worked in the service industry. Uh, uh, in, in like restaurant, I've never worked in a service industry or restaurant um, prior to this, and so this has been like a crash course in assessing people, uh, in serving people, uh, in dishwashing, and um, and then also like not taking it personally, and because it's it's a bizarre thing when you're when you're like when you're selling something that you you've wrapped up so much of your so much of your like passion and your soul into it's it's tough to take a back seat and have this level of disconnection where you're like I don't really care um, because I do very much care I, you know this is uh, like this is you know the culmination of all my of of of, of passion of hard work um, you know and and uh, and years of my life. <laughs> and so that has been the absolute hardest part of this whole of this whole um, project, um, uh, bar none. Uh, I would say the second the second uh, second hardest is definitely compliance work. <laughs> uh, but it it is um, it, it, there's there's room for art. And there's room for this artistic expression. Um, but then there's also these like confines that are that are either bureaucratic or interfacing with the public, and um, and 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 it's it, it's it's so inter it's so interesting. I mean, I I I do uh, have a little bit of um, uh, I would just, I could say jealousy. I have a little bit of jealousy for people who just operate who can operate on a small level or a smaller level. And uh, and and not interface with people as much, um, you know, through either you know through either uh, <clears throat> uh, high end you know like high end uh, um, restaurants or high end distributors. I think that that's that's a beautiful way uh, also to to have people that are very interested in the project. What we've, what we've found, um, or what I found in, in, in this is that, uh, private tours and people who want to, who want to have a more in-depth understanding of, of the project is, 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 is very enjoyable because you know, from the get go that, that, um, that they're here 
they want to li- they want to learn they want to listen um, it's tough when it, it's tougher when somebody just says you know when somebody just shows up at the tasting room and you're talking and you're talking about your passion and you're talking about the project and and you can just see it on their face that they're just like yeah that's nice i'd like to drink some wine now you know <laughs> and uh and it's yeah it, it, it the selling part has been has been um uh, been absolutely uh absolutely a crash course um i'm fortunate where uh where my partner rachel is um is at the helm with me too when it comes to uh most things uh but uh but the the dealing with dealing with with uh, customer base uh, the customer base is is, uh, is 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 difficult yeah <laughs> and she's yeah she's very uh, very adept at adept at that and uh, and uh, some of the 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 detailed nuances nuances of that so obviously you mentioned stewardship sustainability is kind of the the, the the backbone, the, 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 so as you've, as you've worked on this project, as you've had the land, as you've had the grapes and now the wine, tell me, has your sort of definition of sustainability changed at all? And, and if so, or even if not, how do you define sustainability for your business and for your land today? Yeah, I think it's changed a lot. Um, I, yeah, I, I think that the, that there's been, a, that there's a lot of awareness into, uh, into um, what sustainability is, what it looks like. Um, also, some big er- some big errors in in the industry. I mean, we're uh, we're a, a younger brand. Um, there's a, there's a huge amount of expenditure involved with a wine wine production involved with agriculture. Um, I think that. Uh, that it could be set up a lot better the the industry as far as like uh, organic certifications these certifications in general I think that it puts a lot of pressure on smaller businesses uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, in terms of um, the financial uh, financial investment into it um, I think that it can it can behoo- it certainly can behoove the 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 the, the business um, to be able to label things that like that are that are you know organic or you know live but it it also can be um b- but it also can kind of displace displace a lot of smaller farmers i know that there you know i know from experience that there's a lot of farm a lot of smaller farmers that are employing um you know employing techniques that aren't certified just because they because they can't they can't uh, you know they can't allocate those kind of resources to it. Uh, we would kind of fall in the same kind of same kind of category, where it's um, it's it's a, it's a lot of investment as far at, at this term at this stage. I'm I'm not saying we won't we won't do it because I think that it does have does have advantages, um, but there's the there seems to be just kind of a big disconnect between like employing the strategies and getting certification. And, um, and so, you know, our, our, um, our focus on, on sustainability, uh, really doesn't, doesn't shift, uh, uh, you know, even, even though we don't, we're not actively pursuing certification because, um, because of the, because of those reasons. Uh, I think that, you know, things that are popping up like regenerative ag, these kinds of names that, that, um, that aren't part of like a five thousand dollar or ten thousand um, dollar don't have a or don't have a, a price tag of five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars I think that those are those can be really really um, uh, advantageous to smaller producers uh, in in terms of at least letting people know kind of what your what your what your 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 philosophy is behind farming um, so for us, I mean, there there are a few there's a f- like a few components. I mean, we, we knew from the get go that we didn't want to be uh, didn't want irrigation. We wanted it be to be dry farmed. I mean, we our aquifer our wells are over our aquifer. Um, I think that we need we need to safeguard that. We need to look at places like the San Joaquin Valley and see that you know that. Um, that it is a finite resource, 
you know, if you overuse it, uh, you know, your land will will settle. You won't have as much uh, as much capacity for water. And we we have to look at the fact that our timing for for uh, for snowfall in our area is changing. We don't have as much snowpack. You know, late season charging of rivers and riparian areas is it's changing. And and so you know, doing what we can to minimize to minimize uh, our our dependency upon upon a finite resource, I think it's really important. Um, so you know that didn't really change. We knew that from the get go that that was we we wanted to encourage that. It wanted wanted to encourage a, a dry a dry farming situation. I knew that uh, no till was what what was what I wanted to do because. Um, there's a biome underneath the soil that it's in, that that intimately interacts with the vines. Um, I'm not so not so worried about competition. I think all, I think that native species generally in the area have a tendency um, to respond to drought, so they'll kind of go dormant. Uh, I think that timing on those those things is 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 less of a concern less of a concern for me. So um, you know uh, encouraging encouraging pollinators in that kind of regard was you know with with natives native flowers uh makes sense um i would say that uh that the you know i've had a fascination with mycorrhiza for uh since the first time i heard about it um and so that that is uh that has always been part of the part of the equation um sustainability uh in terms of sustainability has has changed a bit in terms of how I've looked at at wine production and as far as like spray programs and I think that uh, moving towards bacterial cultures and uh, some of the some some of these newer forms of, of uh, integrated pest management um, uh, control uh, regimes is is uh, is very important, and so that's something that we're pushing forward with this project. I was unaware of I was unaware of them in, in in the beginning. So using like Bacillus subtilis, and now looking at Regalia and some of these other, you know, some of these other things that can can be um, uh, can be. I don't want to say uh, entirely sustainable because there's absolutely uh, there's absolutely absolutely energy inputs that go into the production of them. Um, I think one of the biggest ones for, uh, for me has probably been really looking at the timing uh, of, 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 when, of when, I'm, when I'm using the tractor, when I'm spraying. Um, it's a shame that, we, that, that, that they're diesel powered. Um, and that's a constraint. You know, we live within these constraints, and so minimizing the minimizing the time uh, in the tractor, uh, I think, is is one of the big one of the big uh, movements forward towards like a more sustainable uh, farming um, uh, farming for me. I, I think that you know, I mean, there's there there are costs, sure. That there's more hand labor, more cultural practices in the vineyard. Um, but um, but I think that that those those outweigh um, those outweigh time of the tractor emissions compaction of the soil um, I think those are all things that we have to have to take into consideration when it comes to uh, you know when it comes to when it comes to sustainability um, outside of the outside of that. Uh, my concept of sustainability is really kind of was guided in the beginning through like uh, through uh, sustainable forestry so like selective harvest no no you know like uh, um, looking at things in a cyclical nature uh, and there's I mean there's some crossover for sure with with wine grapes but I mean it but it's an entirely different beast you're looking at different time scales uh, you know for the most part, if you're looking at forests, you're looking at things that are, you know, uh, m many, m you know, like maybe 80 years or something like that. You know, you're 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 looking at maintaining trees for habitat that are, you know, 80 years old. Whereas, you know, this is a little bit different, where we're like harvesting fruit every year, and um, and it's this ongoing, you know, maintenance of disease pressure and trying to get trying to get fruit. Uh, so. 
Um, yeah, I think that sustainability has kind of uh, has has governed has absolutely governed uh, the the direction of the project. I think that um, I think that probably where we'll where we will evolve in the area is probably probably has to do with water water use and. Uh, uh, and I, I don't know the answer, the answer to that um, in, entirely. I mean, aside from doing the, the, the uh, from a, running a, a dry farm system, uh, I mean, here, this is where we use, I mean, we use, we use water for almost everything, for cleaning barrels, for, and, um, you know, perhaps areas like, uh, perhaps areas like uh, um, California are, are, are ways to, are, are avenues to look at um, ways to minimize water use. Uh, yeah, I, I would I would say that um, the the future of sustainability is is uh, is, is is quite interesting. Um, you know, uh, I, I yeah, it unclear, <laughs> unclear. But um, I think, but uh, you know, but I think that really important to 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 listen to, you know, what the what the forefront of of uh, of the of the scientific community in relation to R and D here in the in the winery is really really important. Uh, you talk about kind of the future of sustainability. Tell me about the future for the brand. What you mentioned, kind of the growth coming from the as the vineyard comes into uh, comes online. Uh, what do you see coming down the line next for you? What are you looking forward to, and what are kind of the next steps? Yeah, uh, the future of the brand. So, I mean, we certainly want to plant more vines. Um, we also have to look at like what our entire, what our capacity for holding is, you know, I think that the sweet spot for this project is about, uh, about 2000 cases a year. So not a huge amount. Um, we have some constraints. Our, 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 our building is, is, is not massive. Um, we have a temperature controlled room that we can stack high but you can only stack so high. Uh, and so I think kind of trying to figure out maybe a cap, um, you know, is going to be, is going to be imperative. Um, but aside, but, but that's, but that's in, in, in the, in the future. Uh, as of right now, we still have space. Um, we are, we expect another probably 30% increase from last year. Um, maintaining more the maintaining these skews from the different soil types so that we can kind of get even you know uh, get that telemetry like we were talking about um i think that that's part of uh, that's absolutely part of the uh part of the trajectory we added some different skews this last year of sparkling white and sparkling red um and, and uh, naturally sparkling white and sparkling red, and uh, we've introduced uh, carbonic, uh, some carbonic uh, red wines, uh, and these are these little skews are to kind of figure out the traction that they the, that they receive within the within the market, and so so far. Um, are uh, those the traction of these smaller skews uh, is is, is um, I mean it, it's more than what we produced. So I think that as the time as kind of time evolve as, as the brand evolves, I think that listening or paying attention to the data that we receive from sales, I think that that really is where we kind of um, where we where we either where we focus and where we generate more. Um, more product, uh, which is which is really which is really uh, rewarding and exciting because the smaller projects are really the creative outlet for for um, for this project. I mean, uh, as as much as I love red wine um, and I love the nuance characteristics of the soils uh, and the nuance characteristics, uh, uh, um, you know, as far as like. A, a, you know, in contact with leaves for durations of time, or you know the influence that those have. Um, uh, there is a fascination with the other, with the other, uh, other production facility or other production sides of things, and um, and uh, and so for sparkling wine, I think that sparkling wine absolutely is the one of the trajectories that I want to take this project because um, because it, it, it the 
we have an area that can just produce high acid wines and uh, and it and it makes sense with the way that we're farming to to utilize that to its to to its to its its fullest potential, and so I think that moving moving um, towards a a very a, a larger um, a larger sparkling um, sp sparkling program is is um, absolutely one of the directions that the brand will go. Um, uh, the carbon, the carbonic, uh, small carbonic wines, you know, th things like that. Uh, th those are also, uh, I think, that uh, you know, fun, fun, uh, fun, different expressions of Pinot Noir that that we really had a had a, um, a fun time kind of uh, expanding people's understanding of you know what a Pinot, what Pinot Noir can 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 produce. Um, a lot of the time, we look at older producers, and it's like uh, red wine and rosé. Um, but there can be so many things in between, you know, that that uh, that can represent um, that can represent Pinot Noir. I mean, one of the one of, even to the extent of we have a lot of people that come through that um, are are blown away by white wine as as Pinot Noir or it, Pinot Noir um, being in a white wine capacity. Um, but um, but the, but the the fact of the matter is, if they've had champagne, they've 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 certainly drank. Uh, Pinot Noir, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so um, so kind of like kind of uh, increasing awareness about about the varietal. Um, I, I think that that's also uh, uh, one of the uh, trajectories that that we want to take take the um, take the project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what do you see as you look ahead for the Oregon wine industry? What what is coming next for for the for sort of the larger state industry? Yeah, I. I don't know. It's it is uh, we kind of represent I don't know the backwaters or something like that. I mean, it, we are not in we are not in wine country. Uh, you know, we're surrounded by like grass farmers. Uh, we don't have a huge amount of vineyards in the area. Um, in a way, it can be really nice because we're insulated, um, but also we represent uh, represent a new growing ground. Uh, I think we represent a lot of smaller producers. A lot of the fruit goes to can go to smaller producers, um, but there's also a movement in the area of these of, of a lot of parcels going towards bigger producers. And I I hope that I hope that that we can there can be enough traction. In the market for small producers um, to develop intimate relationships with growers in the area that can that can pay a good amount of money for the grapes and and maintain that creativity that comes along with the small producer. Uh, I think that you know the presence now of Jackson Family Wines in the area. I think that that. Um, that we we may look at that as a um, as a kind of a uh, as potentially a represent representation of what may happen. I think that I think that one of the biggest issues that we find here is in in the U.S. in general is that we look what we look at economic success or growth and. Uh, it seems that success is generally expansion, um, and expansion generally comes with some kind of oversight and some kind of corporate structure, um, and that generally means like a you know a CFO and CEO, and I and I hope that I mean our project. Uh, I feel privileged the fact that we don't have we don't have that. Um, we are not constrained by that, but I, I hope that the I hope that the small the small producer small producers are able to maintain their um, maintain their independence. Um, I I I don't know exactly what that what that means as far as 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 as, as far as growth. Um, it seems to me like there's a lot of urban wineries that are popping up that may represent that. I think that uh, I, I think that you know the um, 
things like the Carlton Wine Studio can represent these really these great places for smaller winemakers to to, exp to have expressions. But we also have to look at the reality that it's a really expensive it's a, an expensive industry because if you're if you're operating in a in a crust and crush facility, you're you're paying uh, you're paying um, rent, you're paying for grapes, you're paying for all the things, and uh, and the overhead can become can can become um, uh, a massive. Um, so I don't really know the solution. Um, I don't know, necessarily know the solution except for uh, traction to kind of get uh, for us to have traction with within the market for people having awareness of supporting uh, support some supporting smaller labels that uh, that have these connections with with uh, with growers that are employing. Um, so employing techniques that, ha that that have resiliency, you know, I, I think that uh, I think that that's the that's that's where I'd like to see the the industry go. I just don't know if I just you know time will tell. I don't know I don't know what will happen. We you know here in the in this part of the valley, we don't see a huge amount of new producers coming in. Uh, we don't see a huge amount of new new plantings. Um, we may in the future, um, but as of right now, um, it's uh, it, it's it's relatively limited. A lot of the a lot of the vineyards that are that are here have have been around for quite a while. They're just they've been just growing ground, and I'm not sure if that's necessarily a function of Washington County being really difficult to work with and not having not having a winery or a production facility, but. Uh, um, but it, but it is it is a reality, and uh, I I hope that I hope that for us in this area that Washington County um, and uh, Washington County really uh, um, supports and learns to cherish you know what's going on here. I mean, we find ourselves in the in in like the the face of like these major changes that are happening happening within the urban growth boundary, like with the Chips Act. And these big microprocessing plants that are being put in, um, just south of south of 26, and so it really makes it feel um, like there is a like there's a big movement of change, and uh, and 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 we don't really see a huge amount of advocacy um, on the on the on the agricultural side. I mean, when we when we went through the process of of uh, the process and uh, with the county, I mean, we. Um, we uh, we had to adhere to uh, we had to hear adhere to many different um, many different uh, issues uh, uh, you know or or we had to adhere to many different um, um, requirements that aren't existent in Yamhill County mm -hmm. and 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 that 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 doesn't feel supportive you know so I mean. Uh, I, I don't know what what the future looks like in in uh, in the Twalton Hills AVA, but I, I but I hope that I hope that that like I said, I hope that the, the that the growing grounds can go towards smaller producers, and that and that there can be traction in the market. And I, I, I believe that there can I believe that there can be. Um, I've I've seen a, a few. Uh, I've seen a few, or, or I should say more than a few. I've seen some some vineyards in the area be converted to um, organic farming um, because um, because it's economically viable. And I think that if if it can be economically viable, it can if it can be tethered to to these uh, these projects that that are um, not only producing good wine but also are representing good agriculture that that uh, um, th that there 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 can be a, a success story for for the s small producer in the in in the area all right that's all the questions that I have for you uh, anything I didn't ask that I should have anything that we didn't cover here today that you'd like to cover uh, no I just want to say thanks so much for for uh, for coming and talking talking with me um, and uh, showing interest in the project. And uh, yeah, it's been such a pleasure. Absolutely, well thank you, pleasure for us as well. Appreciate you taking the time, sharing your space and sharing your philosophies with us and how the project's gone so far. We'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Cool. Thank you.